Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today here at the Center for Global Security Research within the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. My name is Asma Eskettle, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Trevor Finley, and his lecture is titled Transforming Nuclear Safeguards Culture. Dr. Finley's lecture will draw from his recent book, which was published last year, called Transforming Safeguards Culture, Iraq, the IAEA, and the Future of Nonproliferation. The book examines the role of organizational culture with that, within the IAEA and how that has affected the IAEA safeguard system. Dr. Finley is a principal fellow um, at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne in Australia. His career focuses, um, has focused on disarmament, arms control, and nonproliferation of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. He's held senior uh, positions at think tanks and NGOs in Australia, Canada, Europe, and the United States. He's also served on and chaired the United Nations Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters and the Board of Trustees of the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. So Dr. Finley will uh, pre present for about five minutes, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for questions. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Finley back to CDSR. I'll turn the floor over to you to get us started. Thank you very much, uh, Asmaret, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you all. Um, it's the morning here, um, but uh, good afternoon to, to you all. So as Asmaret mentioned, uh, I'm going to be presenting on my recent book, and uh, I I realize that the audience I'm speaking to are probably quite familiar with safeguards, so I won't go too much into the detail of safeguards. I think I can assume that you are aware of safeguards themselves. But my book, as mentioned, is focused on nuclear safeguards culture, and I'll explain what, what I mean by that as we go through. But I'd like to start out with two slides prepared by the International Atomic Energy Agency that relate to the Iraq case, because my book looks at the Iraq case and asks the question, uh, how, how was it possible that the inspectorate missed the activities of Iraq in seeking to acquire a nuclear weapons uh, capability in the 1990s, 1980s to 90, early 1990s? So I, I start with these two slides, and here is the facility at Tawaifa, which is in Iraq, and the activities that were declared to the International Atomic Energy Agency prior to 1991, that is prior to the um, war over Kuwait. And you'll recall that the inspectors went into Iraq after that war, and uh, they went with this information. This shows the activities declared for Tuwaifa uh, at the nuclear weapons installation prior to 1991. And these are the activities that the inspectors actually discovered after entering Iraq. So you can see an incredible difference. And the question arises, why did the inspectors miss the incredibly uh, sophisticated and substantial nuclear weapons activities that Iraq was engaged in, which they really had no notion of? So the question was why, um, if this was in plain sight, uh, what was it missed? So my book really looks uh, at three different analytical lenses, if you like, in seeking an explanation of why the inspectors missed Iraq. So the first explanation comes from political science, and it is that everything is political, that action by international organizations, and the IAEA is certainly a very good example of one, that action comes through jockeying for power and negotiations. That is essentially, quintessentially a political process. The second lens is the institutional one. So this regards organizations as a kind of machine that can be rationally designed for optimal performance. And here the action takes place through planning and management. So if you have a problem with your machine, then you simply fix it. And if things have gone wrong, then it's because the machine itself has broken down. And the third way is cultural. This is a relatively new lens. It certainly was for me and was for uh, people I interviewed at the IAEA. And the cultural approach really asks the question, what's the way we do things around here? 
compared to the way we tell the world we do things around here. And the action in this case comes through habit and routine. And I'll explain a bit more what I mean by those as we go along. So first, the political explanations. So here the assumption is that the inspectors missed Iraq because the IAEA is governed by sovereign states. Sovereign states in negotiating the safeguards agreements initially uh, really required them not to be too intrusive, certainly not too expensive. The member states were very careful not to give a blank check to the IAEA. The obligations were not too onerous and did not overly impinge on their much valued sovereignty. And this sovereignty issue comes through again and again. And those who seek a political explanation of what happened in the Iraq case, uh, for a point really to the political nature of the Board of Governors, because the Board of Governors is the part of the IAEA that decides on non-compliance cases, whether the state has acted in accordance with the safeguards, safeguards agreement or not. So in this case, um, politics rules. And for, for those people, politics really is ex explanation of why the inspectors missed the Iraq case. Second, and it is not entirely separate from the political explanation, is the institutional one. So there are those who argue the IAEA is a typical UN organization. Uh, it's bureaucratic, it's inflexible, it's inefficient. So in fact, it was inefficiency or incompetence that led to missing uh, the Iraq nuclear uh, installations. But the IAEA, at least comparatively, is amongst the most efficient and effective UN organizations. There have been several studies over the years, including by the GAO and other US bodies, in particular US government bodies, that have concluded that the IAEA is amongst the most efficient and effective of UN organizations. So there's, there's nothing to say that the IAEA was typical in that sense. And in fact, it was probably amongst the better organizations. There's also the question, and this is controversial among some scholars, as to how much autonomy the Secretariat has. And here I like to bring in what's called the principal agent theory. And the idea as it is that the agent is given authority by the principals. In this case, this is the, the agent is the IAEA, and the principals are member states. And in this, according to this theory, over time, the agent, because it's been asked to carry out certain responsibilities for the principal, becomes more expert than any of the single principals involved. And certainly in this case, the IAEA, over decades now, it was formed in 1957, has become more competent, more expert about nuclear matters than the vast majority of its member states. Certainly the United States and other major players in the nuclear field do have um, expertise which matches and outdoes the IAEA in some cases. But certainly in terms of most member states, the agency itself is the more knowledgeable and the more experienced. You think about in Vienna, the diplomats change every few years, the agency carries on. So there's something about um, the IAEA, about UN organizations um, as a whole, that give them a certain autonomy uh, and enables them to act uh, with some sort of uh, relative independence. I wouldn't want to overstate this. So in this case, the institutional explanation might say that actually the Secretariat had the ability and authority to investigate Iraq more and should have done so. Now that is a type of institutional explanation as well. Nonetheless, the bottom line, uh, as usual in international relations, is that there is a, a classic dilemma involved. That is autonomy versus deference. So international organizations, including the IAEA, are always looking over their shoulder at what their member states. And I like the quote below because I think it really encapsulates this, this difficulty, this dilemma, that you can bite the hand that feeds you, but you can't bite it off. And so international organizations are always uh, careful to make sure they don't uh, alienate at least the most powerful member states. And they are often involved in trade-offs between what the major powers want and what the vast majority of member states uh, themselves want.
I talk a bit about the inspectors here because they were the ones who were criticised most about having missed Iraq. Um, and certainly in the early days, safeguards were amateurish. Uh, inspectors were poorly recruited, trained, and and sometimes not even debriefed at all. And if they were, it was a very cursory thing. But the system had much improved by the 1980s. And as far as I can tell, safeguards were applied to Iraq uh, as required. The inspectors did what they were required to do within the system that they'd been trained in, and they did not really uh, divert from that. So you can say in some ways that they did exactly what they were supposed to do in Iraq and no more, and the no more may be, of course, the problem. There was no evidence of diversion from a declared program in Iraq. So that was something that the inspectors uh, concluded, there was no diversion. So in that case, though, they were correct. The problem was um, in other aspects of the program, not in diversion from the declared program. So the inspectors did what they were supposed to do in Iraq, um, and uh, there's no evidence they were soft on Iraq. In fact, most of the inspectors were um, Soviet and Hungarian, so they probably, if you're thinking they were doing what their governments wanted to do, were keeping a, a close eye on Iraq because the Soviets didn't necessarily want another nuclear weapon state um, in close proximity to them. Now let me talk to organisational culture, and this is the one that probably many people are uh, least familiar with, and certainly I was when I started this project. I, I'm a political scientist by training. I do have some background in international law and organisations, but the cultural thing um, initially eluded me, and I struggled with this because it can be, in some people's minds, rather amorphous and difficult to pin down. And the challenge here is that cultures, organisational cultures, represent uh, quite latent, often unconscious values that don't necessarily appear at the surface. So it's about values, norms, perceptions, attitudes, and many of these are born of habit. And as the longer an organization goes on, the more habit forming the culture, cultures are. And those who don't uh, get with the program, those who don't like the culture, can either change it or leave, and mostly they leave. Uh, Otherwise, um, life is very uncomfortable at, the, at an organisation for them. So over time, you can imagine that cultures tend to solidify rather than uh, dissipate. So for this reason, it's very hard to analyse and interpret culture. It's also something that's constantly in flux, um, often towards the strengthening rather than loosening. Uh, it affects individual and collective behaviour. So one always has to try and pull apart the individual elements of culture in terms of individual motivations, and then also look at the collective behaviour. What collectively does the organisation do as a result of this culture? There can, of course, as we know from many examples, be dysfunctional culture, and sometimes this leads to complete failure. There have been organisations over the years in industry and in government that have failed really because of the culture and have had to be overhauled. Culture is uh, very hard to change deliberatively, uh, but it's easiest after a crisis. And as we will see after the Iraq crisis, and some people in the agency did call it a crisis, the agency itself went about changing it, its safeguards regime and in the process changed the culture. And so this was quite an opportune time to do that. Otherwise, it may have been difficult to have changed. One problem with cultural change, though, is you can force the change and then you can have unintended consequences. This probably means there are deep-seated problems with the culture that really aren't changed uh, as much as one thinks. And we'll, we can talk about some examples in safeguards uh, as we come to that. The way you have a good functioning organisational culture is through leadership and incentives. So. Uh, organisations have to ensure their employees are incentivised in the direction of the culture that the leadership want. And the leadership also have to uh, walk the walk and talk the talk. They have, to, they have to present the culture that they want in both their behaviour and in their attitudes. 
So in investigating organizational culture, I used Edgar Schein, who's the guru of uh, organizational culture, and he breaks it down into these three areas. And this is a method really of looking at an organization's culture. So one looks at the artifacts, and these are the visible organizational structures and processes. So it's things like protocols, it's the uh, statements of intent that the organization has, it is the treaties in this case and agreements reached, it is the processes by which people are trained and brought into an organization. You can imagine all these, in a sense, physical things, even things like the uh, IAEA flag, the IAEA uh, inspectors gear, their uniforms when they go into uh, on-site inspections. All these things can be regarded as the artifacts and culture. And uh, if you think about them intensively, you can see that there are cultural signals given through artifacts. The second area that Shine identified was the espoused values. So these are the things that an organization says it does and wants to do and intends to do. So the mission statement is a classic thing that comes from organizations. And we've all read mission statements where we think, well, yes, that's all very well, but does the organization really try and do this? Does the organization actually accomplish this? Or is there something else that's not mentioned that the organization tries to do? <clears throat> and it doesn't have to just be explicit mission statements. It can be about uh, goals and philosophies espoused by, for instance, the leadership. Then finally, and the part that often does um, cause some misunderstanding is the hidden assumptions behind an organization. And these are unconscious, they're often taken for granted. And um, when you ask employees of an organization to talk about their basic underlying assumptions, they often have great difficulty because they tend to say what they've Im imbibed as the official line for organizations. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, so it's a bit like psychoanalysis to try and get behind what people really feel about their work. Uh, often they'll be quite reluctant to do that or really are unconscious about, about what exactly uh, they feel about their, their work. So in looking at the IAEA's culture <clears throat> uh, and the Iraq case in particular, I zero in uh, in the book on the idea of undeclared um, versus declared facilities and activities. So I bring this slide up to show the standard text um, of IA safeguards in CERC 153. I presume everyone's at least somewhat familiar with this. And this standard text says that essentially the IAEA should be verifying all source or special fissionable material in all peaceful nuclear activities. And in this case, uh, the activities within the territory of Iraq. So the all is really important here. It's not some, it's just not that which was declared, but it's all nuclear material. And I identify this because this is one of the uh, statements by the IAEA within a, an agreement, a bilateral agreement between it and member states, which sends a message and can be regarded as a cultural artifact. It, it says that safeguards are concerned with all nuclear materials and all uh, activities. So the question is, if this is the case, then why did the agency not discover all peaceful nuclear activities uh, in the country of Iraq? And the way I looked at this was to consider the views of three different people who are very familiar with safeguards and who are all puzzled about why the IAEA did not pursue all nuclear activities uh, in the territory of Iraq. And I think they're extremely enlightening. And as I said, often it's difficult to get people to talk about culture and identify exactly uh, what it is in the culture that's problematic. And so the first is by Roger Housley, um, who <clears throat> uh, now is an expert on nuclear uh, security, but was originally working for BNFL in uh, the UK. And he was taken on a visit to Vienna by his boss. And he was briefed on safeguards. And afterwards, this is in Vienna, and he said, uh, 
And I remember saying to him, that's his boss, I really don't understand why safeguards is limited to the verification of declared material because who would divert declared material? And with a slight air of superiority, this is a very British story, he sort of tapped me on the head and said, well, eventually you'll get to understand what this is all about. So this is a classic uh, example of the culture and the culture not, not explicitly saying what things are about. And then next I have two experts, and you're all probably, probably familiar with these names, Myron Kratzer and Richard Hooper, who both uh, were instrumental in shaping the safeguards uh, regime. And Myron says, it's quite surprising, these are, these are both quotes from the um, Pacific Northwest Laboratories interviews with people on safeguards, the origins of safeguards. And they're online and they're really interesting to look at. So Myron says, how anyone could pick up this safeguards document, that's the one I've just showed you, that the ob agency's obligation, right, and obligation is to apply safeguards to all material and to end up saying, well, all we really have to do is apply our safeguards to declared material is to me the mystery of safeguards. This is quite uh, an amazing quote as well. Then Rick Hooper, who was one of the great, great men of safeguards, he says, I went to considerable effort. This was for the, the Pacific Northwest um, seminar series itself. And I was certainly in a position to find out why did things develop the way they did? Why the focus on declared vis-a-vis -vis undeclared with a basic undertaking of states clearly provided the possibility of both? Question mark. But in the end, the conclusion I came to was all these questions are largely rhetorical, that there is no answer. It just is that way. So <laughs> that's a classic description of culture. It just is that way, the way we do things around here. I should say that my book also goes uh, into many more aspects of safeguards culture, not just the issue of declared, but it seems to me that this is the most uh, striking example of, of a culture that I think um, went adrift. Through no one's fault in particular, but just went adrift. So how could this happen? So a large part of my book, I guess the, the uh, most challenging part is to identify how this really could happen. I think there are multiple explanations here. There's not just one. So the original safeguards agreements were regarded as a sort of gentleman's agreement. They weren't necessarily designed to be uh, the sharpest, the most involved, the most intrusive, the most expensive, as, as I've mentioned. Uh, because states really didn't want to do that. There was a huge element of trust in it. And some states explicitly said that safeguards were a confidence building measure, not really a verification regime. So from the earliest days, there was this notion that if states went to all the trouble of um, acceding to the MPT and signing a safeguards agreement, they really weren't going to violate it. That if they were going to violate, they wouldn't have uh, acquired a safeguards agreement in the first place. So that's what I mean by gentlemen's. I suppose it should be gentle persons agreement these days, although they were all men negotiating the original safeguards agreements. Uh, the second is that it's challenging enough to verify declared materials. So I think it's easy to forget that in the early days, the IEA was approaching this um, uh, as a new global activity. No one had ever done this before to set up a global regime to monitor declared nuclear materials. It was an enormous undertaking and the agency in its early days struggled to figure out how it would go about this to acquire the necessary expertise and uh, certainly the finance to do this. So that was enough of a challenge. So the idea that somehow they would spend a lot of time thinking about what states hadn't declared was probably unrealistic at that stage. This should have changed as time went on, but certainly in the early days, I think this was the case. Secondly, or thirdly rather, there's a human tendency to focus on what we can see and count. And uh, John Carlson makes this point that it's, it's just a natural human tendency to want to count things that have been declared and ensure them in order. It's much harder to try and uh, imagine things that haven't been uh, presented uh, and, and to try and account for those things that haven't been presented. Then there are linguistic difficulties. I haven't seen anyone really consider this, but there's something about the word diversion that is a bit misleading in English because what Iraq did was to create a whole separate 
nuclear fuel cycle apart from what it declared. So, and diversion wasn't really at the essence of it. it. It was really about the creation of a whole new nuclear fuel cycle. So there's something about this word diversion, and I know it's come really from the original US bilateral agreements with states where the US was concerned about the diversion of material and technology to provide it to individual states. So the word was quite apt there. But since then, it doesn't really, to my mind, at least in English, uh, cover all the possibilities uh, whereby states can violate their safeguards obligations. Next, there is the difficulty of proving a negative. So even if inspectors are concerned that something has uh, occurred apart from uh, diversion, there is a difficulty of proving this to the satisfaction of member states, which again, of course, comes back to the politics of it, having a strong enough case that member states will agree that there has been uh, some sort of non-compliance uh, case. States are unwilling to countenance fishing expeditions or provide intelligence. So this was true um, uh, up until the Iraq case that states really didn't like the idea of inspectors wandering around. So challenge inspections had never been used. And the only time that special inspections in the IA case were was requested, um, that was North Korea, shortly after the Iraq case, the North Koreans simply turned it down. So this idea of special inspections was really never uh, put into practice. And that was one of the tools that had been provided to the agency in order to uh, discover undeclared facilities and materials. And states, of course, were not willing in the early days to provide intelligence information. The IEA itself probably wouldn't have known what to do with it. And states were worried, of course, about sources and methods. That has changed considerably since the Iraq case. Uh, as we all know. Inspections also became routinized and any human activity that becomes routinized uh, starts to induce complacency because the focus then is on the routine rather than actual the actual question that you're trying to investigate. And all regulatory agencies uh, have trouble with this uh, challenge. How do you keep inspectors from becoming complacent? Finally, and related to this, is the issue of cognitive dissonance. Uh, human beings are very good at ignoring particular things that they're not looking for. And I think this probably was true in the Iraq case. Uh, there's a famous experiment at Harvard, of course, with the, the group of um, observers watching a basketball game and being asked to count the tries. And uh, a, a man in a gorilla suit runs across the court. And uh, again and again, this experiment was shown that 50% of the observers miss the fact that a gorilla has run across the court. This is, sounds like a flippant example, but I think it just illustrates the problem of uh, cognitive dissonance, dissonance that it's very easy for human beings not to see things that are in plain sight. So let me talk now about the way the IEA has changed its culture. And when I first started this project uh, many years ago, probably a decade ago now, it seemed the agency hadn't changed very much in terms of its culture. But I think it's true to say now that cultural change has, change has occurred. And it's not really because the agency deliberately thought, oh, we must change our culture, or because there was some great acknowledgement of the role of culture, but really that, that other aspects of safeguards changed so dramatically that the culture necessarily uh, changed along with it. So here we some of, have some of the artifacts of the IAA's culture. And uh, certainly you're all familiar with the strength and safeguard system, the additional protocols, the revised um, SQPs, but also, and some people may not be aware, the strategic plan of the safeguards department now lays out uh, several ways which at least implicitly uh, change the culture, and that includes long-range forecasting to identify proliferation threats over the horizon. Then we have process artifacts. They've also changed considerably. And these, because they involve human activity, necessarily have changed the culture. <clears throat> Pardon me. So these state evaluation groups, for instance, um, in the old days, inspectors would come back and no one would really talk to them. They might be asked occasionally to brief um, the higher ups, but, but now you have a state evaluation group for every country, which looks at every country under safeguards each year in terms of um, how the safeguard system is working, including any anomalies, 
including any uh, things that should be looked at in future, any questions that might have arise, uh, arisen. So this is quite a different um, situation than previously and does lead to um, a different culture uh, automatically. Uh, open source information, of course, is now available to safeguards, which it wasn't um, during the Iraq period, not explicitly anyway. And of course, intelligence information is now available um, as states uh, provided. Now I'll turn to the espoused values. So in this area too, the IEA has deliberately changed its culture. It has, um, it now says explicitly several things which it never said before. Uh, on the diversion side, it now says all acquisition paths are worth considering. So it actually has a process to consider all acquisition paths for each individual country. And here I think is the, the rub of the issue that I was talking about before undeclared versus declared, and that's the emphasis on correctness and completeness. This has now become part of the mantra of the IAEA, and um, it's trotted out at every conceivable opportunity, which is a good thing because that's not what used to be the case. Uh, the emphasis previously was on correctness of declarations, not on their completeness. So this is a key uh, cultural change, and I think not only is it espoused, but I think it actually has been uh, imbibed by um, those in, in the agency. The way training is conducted has improved so that now inspectors are expected to be more inquisitive, more investigatory, more innovative. This is certainly a, a significant cultural change. Previously, the, uh, the training was really focused on uh, the uh, particular activities at uh, nuclear sites in terms of filling out forms about checking the machines, um, some interviews with staff, but not um, on the, the level that we currently uh, expect to see. So really quite a change in the way inspectors are perceived. And finally, um, all sources of information are now to be used, and this is now a spouse value. So the agency does not hide the fact that it, it might at times rely on information from member states that is intelligence information, and that it uses this information to draw a broader conclusion about the state every year. So the broader conclusion means that the agency can, uh, as far as it is able, and according to the information available, draw the conclusion that all nuclear material and uh, activities have been accounted for in the state. That is quite a different conclusion to the one that the agency used to draw. Now comes the hard part, the underlying uh, assumptions behind the culture. So as I mentioned, correctness and completeness uh, is now seen as vital. It has become a mantra, and I still think uh, it, that is perceived by most people now in the agency as being uh, the way safeguards should operate. There is an underlying assumption now that there should be close collaboration between inspectors analysts, planners, uh, laboratories and managers, and that all can make a valuable contribution. So now, for instance, at Cybersdorf, the nuclear laboratory that, that conducts tests on samples is integrated into the safeguards uh, staff. Previously, this was not the case. So that's just one example of where something practical has, has happened as a result of these new underlying assumptions. There's now an assumption that those who are resourceful and take initiative in the safeguards area, including the inspectors, will be rewarded. So that is uh, a change in assumption. All safeguards findings should be taken seriously. Uh, and there's assumption that inspectors are well-trained, recruited and imbued with a new culture, whereas previously there was a great deal of scepticism about whether safeguards inspectors were really uh, as top-notch as, as was claimed. So with these underlying assumptions, um, the difficulty as a researcher is that I can only make uh, ad hoc uh, ventures into this in terms of speaking to people um, and not, I'm not able to do a systematic uh, cultural study. So there are continuing questions about this. And in my book, I admit this is the case. One way that you can investigate culture is to interview all of the employees in a particular organization, 
you can conduct brainstorming sessions, you can uh, circulate a questionnaire, and through these various methods, which is what um, organisational investigators do, you can reach some conclusions about the culture, um, if possible. It's not always the case. Uh, some studies don't really do much to reveal the underlying culture. So my challenge here was that I was not able um, under the previous Director General, that is Mr. Romano, to conduct such a study. This would simply not have been possible um, because the attitude towards researchers and non-governmental organisations was to keep them really at arm's length. So the difficulty for me is that I can look at the, uh, the things that are in the public domain. I can talk informally to people at the agency, but I wasn't able for the book to do a systematic cultural uh, study. That, that really has to be done by professionals that the agency brings in. It can't be done internally because those who work for an organisation, of course, are within the culture themselves and may not recognise um, the dysfunctions or the uh, difficulties in a culture. So this is an ongoing question. How much is the new culture embedded at the IAEA? I'm not uh, absolutely sure. Uh, what I am sure is that the new Director General, Mr. Grossi, does get it. He does understand that there is something about organisational culture that needs to be uh, cultivated. And he himself has provided, I believe, leadership in this. And the example I give is his attitude towards the inspectors. So he makes a great um, uh, demonstration of supporting inspectors in Ukraine, for instance, in their incredibly dangerous and challenging work. He has gone to the Zaboritsia nuclear power plant and others to uh, show solidarity with uh, his employees who are at the plant, and he constantly stresses how brave they are and what they are sacrificing in terms of their own uh, safety and personal life back in Vienna. So this is quite quite new and is something that Mr. Grossi recognises as extremely important in supporting um, the culture and particularly in supporting the uh, inspectorate. There are, of course, um, current challenges with the culture in terms of Iran uh, that I'm not able to investigate as much as I'd like to because of the, the problem of interviewing people. But it seems to me that, at least in terms of the uh, correctness and completeness issue and about the determination of the agency not to be misled by a member state, that the culture is holding up well uh, in respect of Iran. It, Iran is obviously a very difficult case and governments themselves have trouble dealing uh, with, with that country. But it seems the agency is performing well in terms of, of its culture. It is actually doing uh, what it says it's supposed to be doing in Iran, notwithstanding the, uh, the difficulties. There are major new tests. Uh, I've already mentioned Ukraine, and that, that is one of them. Uh, the Orca submarines is an issue, and it, it's an issue in this case because of uh, paragraph 14 requirement. The agency is required to uh, uh, have from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia uh, an approach, an, an approach that's negotiated under. Article 14, and um, it's not at all clear that the AUKUS case fits that Article 14. So the challenge for the agency and its underlying culture in terms of, of uh, meeting its mandated uh, functions is to ensure that, that it comes out with a, uh, an agreement that is satisfactory, not just to the three parties, but to the agency itself and the overall membership. So that that's quite a challenge involving not just negotiations, but about uh, the underlying culture of the agency as it has now um, evolved since the Iraq case. Another question for me is to whether is whether Iraq will adopt a deliberative cultural approach. They have been reluctant in the past to talk about or, or use the word culture. Uh, as I said in their strategic planning and other documents, they do use language that, that approaches uh, what I would call as classic cultural language. So in a way, it doesn't really matter as long as they are aware that there is something called organisational culture and that it can affect their organisation. 
Uh, there is a difficulty that's been mentioned to me in that because the agency is a multicultural organization, it, it's comprised of a um, hundred or more different nationalities from member states that that employees might think that their own national culture is being challenged or affected by the agency adopting the language of organizational culture. I can see this this could be a problem, so perhaps it's better not that they don't they don't go down this route, but um, it, I think that could be exaggerated and that if um, they do use the classic uh, cultural uh, language that that will be then be be more understandable and they'll then be able to draw on a very large corpus of of work uh, from the cultural organizational uh, theorists and and practitioners and that that will be adopted more readily into the organization so finally um, amongst these continuing questions how can member states promote an effective culture at the IAA this is uh, again a challenge because not all member states will recognize that this is a problem or an issue or will be skeptical about it so it's really up to those states which do um, believe that this is um, an issue and worthwhile pursuing to to advance it and to support essentially the leadership of the IAEA um, in its efforts to um, enhance the culture. And as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Director General Grossi does seem to be aware of the cultural approach and certainly the safeguards department now is there are several senior people in the department who recognize uh, the importance of this. Uh, states, of course, have their own national safeguards culture, um, whether they like it or not. Iraq had a terrible safeguards culture that was designed to mislead inspectors. But we would hope that most states with safeguards agreement have a healthy, uh, positive uh, safeguards culture in their own national uh, establishment and that they themselves can help the agency uh, with its own uh, efforts in this regard. Uh, in the other direction, of course, the IAEA can, by having its own healthy safeguards culture, be a model for member states, particularly those who are less uh, technically capable. And it seems to me the agency, by having this robust safeguards culture, can imbue uh, member states with that as well. And also in its work with them in improving their, their state systems of accounting and control, for instance, could be uh, have more of an emphasis on organizational culture that will help member states have a more effective uh, SSAC. Finally, one of the challenges I've identified and a continuing question is how the changing work phase, uh, workforce will change the culture of the agency. So often when there's a major change in personnel, the culture will shift and organizations need to be very aware that this is a possibility and plan for it. In the case of the agency, the Director General has had a very ambitious target for increasing uh, diversity in the organization. And this includes in just a few years, having at least 50% of the IA's personnel women. And this will change the culture of the organization, whether the agency likes it or not. And it really needs to be prepared uh, for this possibility. One can imagine, for instance, uh, the change is necessary for female inspectors in the field, whereas previously it's only been men who went into the field. And how does one um, handle this change in terms of attitudes and assumptions and uh, quite apart from the, the, the practicalities of doing this? Uh, so I am um, heartened by one thing that uh, uh, Director General Grossi has said, which is, and by the way, women make the best inspectors. I'm not sure whether that's true or not, uh, but it certainly is a marker that we should all be aware that the culture of the agency will, will change necessarily. The agency is also trying to ramp up its recruitment of staff from developing countries, which is it is mandated to do and has struggled over many years. Um, and that also will uh, necessarily change the culture of what has been uh, very much hitherto a Western-driven organization. So I'll just leave you with a final quote from Peter Drucker, who is one of the great gurus of uh, management theory. And he says that culture eats strategy for breakfast. 
So I'll leave those thoughts with you and I look forward to any uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much.